This week on Quadriga, Afghanistan, a lost cause. Germany's Bundeswehr troops are pulling out of the northern Afghan province of Kunduz. Almost all NATO forces are due to leave Afghanistan by the end of 2014. The Afghan army will have the responsibility of dealing with the Taliban insurgency on its own. The government will have to maintain the gains made in development and human rights since 2001. But there is a huge question mark over whether it will be able to do that. The government of President Hamid Karzai is widely perceived as corrupt. Its army is weak. Are foreign troops leaving too soon? What's next for the country? Peace or more war? Your host this week, Ali Aslan. Hello and welcome to Quadriga. Afghanistan's football and cricket teams are producing extraordinarily positive results. But unfortunately, the same cannot be said of the political situation in the country, which still remains very much fragile. So the question is, with the international mission set to end by the end of 2014, where is the country headed? And that is exactly what we will ask and discuss on today's show together with three experts who have been following events in Afghanistan very closely. Welcome to Malai Stout, who is a political analyst from Afghanistan based in Berlin. He's also the founder of the Afghan Youth Foundation for Unity and served previously as the chief of staff of the Transition Coordination Commission in Afghanistan. Robert Reed is the bureau chief for the Associated Press in Germany. Previously, he was based in Kabul, where he served as the AP's news director for Afghanistan and Pakistan. And Karin Schädler is a freelance journalist with a focus on Afghanistan, a country she has visited several times. She also serves as the regional coordinator for Afghanistan at the Deutsche Welle Academy, where she's organizing media development projects in Afghanistan. Welcome to the show, Malai Chopin Daud. Now the US troops are set to leave by the end of 2014. That is at least what President Obama has promised and pledged to the American people. Is that a move too early, too soon? Well, first of all, we have to be clear. These are combat uh, troops you are talking about. And we still have the negotiations over the bilateral security agreement going on. And uh, as far as I'm aware, and our Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs said a few days ago that it's just weeks away. And um, President Karzai has revealed that there could be nine military bases of the U.S. post-2014. On the question whether or not it's too early, um, um, I had my doubts two years ago when I used to work for the Transition Coordination Commission. But now looking at the way the Afghans, especially the Afghan government, has responded, and our security forces in particular, um, it seems to be uh, the right move. What we need is, uh, according to our former intelligence agency uh, head, uh, a, a proper relationship with the world, especially the U.S. Uh, their presence and no longer counts because our security forces have basically shown in the past few months that they are pretty much capable of uh, taking over the security. Uh, of course it's fragile, of course there are uh, p spaces that are contested, uh, of course uh, there's this desertion from the army and the police, but still uh, the progress has been remarkable given the fact that the, uh, the focus on our security forces only happened in 2008-2009. Robert Reed, uh, Malaj Daud says the withdrawal is the right move. Uh, would you agree? I think the withdrawal is the, is the obvious move at this point. First of all, I don't think you ever get to a situation where the time to leave is right. That's, that's just not going to happen. It's like a lot of things in life. You know, you hear, you know, in 30, 40 years ago, people used to say in the United States, uh, you know, the time's not right for racial integration. Well, it happened, it, you know, they adapted. Um, politically, there's no support in the United States for maintaining this mission in Afghanistan. It's gonna be hard enough to keep seven to 8,000 American troops there anyway. Um, and so I think it, at this point, it's a situation where all sides have done all that they reasonably can do to prepare for this move. And now it's just basically up to the Afghans. I might point out that, you know, there are lessons that should be taken from the Soviet experience in Afghanistan. And one of those is withdrawal doesn't necessarily have to mean abandonment. Mm. Um, I mean, I think what, what sank Najibullah's government as much as anything was the collapse of the Soviet Union. And lack of funding. And the lack of funding. 
Um, you know, their army was doing respectable in the field. But if, if, um, if withdrawal does not mean abandonment, then there is a chance that this will succeed. Karin Shela, you just returned from Afghanistan. You spent uh, some, some time there. What is the mood on the ground? When you talk to uh, the average Afghan people on the street, what, what is the mood uh, these days? Yeah, I think it is actually quite interesting because I think what you said, that there is not enough support in our countries to continue this mission is basically because people here really don't know what Afghans think about it and how thankful they are for what development workers have done and also how the military has supported them. Um, so what I have seen during my visits there is that people, ex especially in the north, are very, very thankful. Uh, always mention prestige objects like infrastructural uh, help uh, with the new airport, with a new teacher learning center that hasn't existed before. Um, <clears throat> and also just obvious things like bridges, streets and so. So I think people see that and they also see the little things that we do and that little development organizations do. And uh, yeah, and it's always surprising to people here. <laughs> it is very surprising. They always say, yeah, they are thankful, really? I didn't think so. Because of course, the images they get uh, from Afghanistan are quite different and they cannot really interpret them well. <laughs> but aside from being thankful, is there also a sense of anxiety uh, with the date of 2014, with the withdrawal looming? Well, I've seen both. I've seen anxi anxiety on the one hand, uh, that people are afraid what might happen, a lot afraid, especially those who have helped us a lot, who have uh, said things in the last years that might not be very popular in the next time, uh, if there is a transition in power. Uh, but on the other hand, I've also seen people who said, yeah, we are kind of ready to take more uh, responsibility now. And we have to do that also. So there is also this, this sense of people that they, it's their job and we can't all be there forever. But I think that is just true uh, for some of the things we're doing there. But of course, in many, many fields, they still need help. And I'm really um, hoping that the civil help we are giving to Afghanistan will continue to be there. Uh, and for a long time, not only short-time projects that will uh, not be sustainable. And Malai's doubt the Afghan people are ready to take on more responsibility, says Karin Shedla. And indeed, they will have to. The Afghan army, for instance, uh, is already in charge of security control uh, of the country. Do you think they're up for the task? Well, I pretty much think so. As uh, Rava said before, like the, our army in the past, and, uh, when uh, they were capable of basically uh, continuing to, to save the, the, the state. And uh, only the funding was cut off from the Soviet Union, and then the collapse happened. It's still the case. I mean, we need uh, around about $4 billion a year for our military support. And uh, if that keeps trickling in, I think uh, the army and the police are pretty much capable of defeating uh, the, the not i mean they can create a long haul you know they can create a deadlock for a long time and that will basically wear out the insurgency and the terrorists um, uh, because the uh, they're, they're encouraging signs that right now they're conducting an operation in azra district of of uh, logar and uh, it went pretty well you know the but of course there are lots of issues too so you cannot ignore them lots of issues which we will discuss of course on today's show robert Reed, there, there is a question uh, some people are wondering, namely, if the average Afghan is better off now than he or she was before 2001, before the ISF mission started to Afghanistan. You've been to Afghanistan many times. You've lived there. You covered Afghanistan extensively. What, what is your sense? I think they're better off than they were in the Taliban times. I think they're better off in the urban areas than they were during the Civil War, certainly. Um, I think... Um, but I think, you know, the problem with talking about Afghanistan is we use this word Afghanistan. There are many Afghanistans. Sure. And, there, you know, and per public perceptions and situations can vary dramatically from, you know, from place to place. If you ask, uh, you know, a middle class Afghan in Kabul, is, is he worried about the troops leaving? He'll, and he's frank, he'll probably tell you yes. If you talk to some guy in Panjwai, he's probably happy that they're leaving. You know, it just, it, it varies quite a bit. And I think this is part of the challenge in Afghanistan, you know, to, to bring this disparate country, you know, together into some sort of cohesive unit. Um, and I think it's going to take a lot of 
it's going to challenge the statecraft of, of a lot of Afghan leaders in the coming years. And Karin Schiele, Robert Reed has just uh, exemplified the intricacies and the complexities of this country called Afghanistan. Do we in the so-called West properly understand the country even 12 years after the mission started? You've been there many times. Do you think we have a good grasp of, of the country and its complex setup? Well, in general, I, I would say we don't because, uh, of course, what we hear from Afghanistan is very, very limited. And one example for me is the working women in Afghanistan, where um, I have seen women who are, of course, also worried uh, that we're leaving because they are now in a much better situation than they used to be. Um, yeah, but that, that are women that are not perceived here at all. <laughs> so, um, and also, you know, that we, we look a lot about how things look. Uh, for example, that the burqa has not gone away, so you still see all those pictures uh, with women wearing the burqa. But when you look a little bit more on the details, you see women just um, maybe pulling it over a while or not wearing it in the car or things like that. There are maybe that are little things, but you see that there is a sense of a little bit more liberty. And I think that's also important, you know, not only the, the big, big, big achievements, but the, the little things where people feel they can dress a bit more freely. For example, also women in the North who only wear a scarf and only until here, you know, like we know it from India. Um, yeah, so that's positive things I, I, I see. And uh, I think we shouldn't forget about those developments as well. As an Afghan living in Berlin, uh, Malai's doubt, do you think we in the West have a superficial uh, perception of your country of Afghanistan? Well, uh, the media does, and it's understandable because people tend to, uh, I mean, not really try to understand everything about the country. But there are also some foreigners who have lived in the country for a long time. They have a good level of understanding of the country. But to be honest, this question, even if you pose it to an Afghan like me, I've lived there all my life, you know, it's a difficult one to answer. I would not know every corner of the country. There are so many complexities that I would also not know fully about. So it's only a question of having a good sense of what is going on and then building upon that and basically then sorting out, sorting out the whole situation. But even as an Afghan, you, you cannot claim you know everything about the country. Robert Reed, this mission of course started in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. It was led by the United States to root out Al-Qaeda out of Afghanistan um, and to take revenge, if you will. Um, now, Al-Qaeda, many people would argue, is no longer a force in Afghanistan itself. But they've moved elsewhere. They've moved to Mali and other countries in, in the Middle East. Uh, do, do you think this problem has been solved or just, just been shifted away, geographically speaking? No, I don't think it's been solved. I don't think it's been solved because the wrong tools were used to, you know, to combat it. Although I personally... Uh, have sympathy for the U.S. administration in deciding to, you know, use a military option in Afghanistan, um, you know, given the realities of, you know, two plus thousand dead in the United States. But, um, no, at some point, the, you know, the whole thing morphed. It, it changed from a mission that was, you know, to defeat al-Qaeda to one that was supposed to reinforce the government and therefore inherently morphed again to one to oppose the government's enemies, which, you know, were the resurgent Taliban. And now we have a situation where even if you accept uh, White House arguments that there are fewer than 100 full-time al-Qaeda operatives in, in Afghanistan, it's irrelevant. It's just a name. You have, you know, hostile political Islam operating in, in Afghanistan and in Pakistan and in Yemen and in... Um, parts of Tunisia and a whole range of countries. So no, the problem has has shifted. It's uh, it's like it's like trying to pick up a ball of mercury. So there's a lack of strategy then, if you if I understand you correctly. There's been a lack of strategy on the part of the U.S. and the ISAF mission. Yeah, I think well, I think the ISAF mission was f to do a particular job and they did it. But I think broadly speaking. The Americans have had trouble in coming up with a strategy to deal with Al Qaeda as an idea and as a political movement that transcends national borders. I don't think that's a secret. Isn't it also because Al Qaeda itself has transformed so much? So strategizing against a force that has been uh, modifying itself is not easy. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's like you know treating a disease that you know morphs. Um, becomes resistant to vaccines. Although I think, in a way, you know, part of this is a I don't know whether 
Part of it might be that we never have fully understood what Al Qaeda was, even in 1996. Mm. You know, and I hear people talk about, oh well, Al Qaeda's changed. I mean, the very word, you know, it means the base. You know, I, I like to think of old Al Qaeda in a way like a, an investment bank, where people came up with ideas, be they ideas in the Hamburg cell to go, you know, to launch an air attack in the United States or something else like this, and they went to Al Qaeda to you know, like a, an entrepreneur does to a bank. I have an idea, I need your support. They got the support. That's quite different from a highly structured Western style party that conceives ideas and projects and sees them through. And I don't think this difference has ever been fully grasped and appreciated. So therefore, it the actually has been. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm cutting mm -hmm. off here because the General McChrystal, the former commander of uh, ISAF, he has done after he retired. He d did a nautical where he basically said that we were fighting against a network, yes. and we had to become a network actually to be able to tackle the problem. Well, I mean, you know, that's General McChrystal. The problem is, I don't think even that idea has been sold entirely to the publics and the ruling establishments in the West. Karin Sheila, rooting out the Al-Qaeda out of Afghanistan is one thing. Uh, the Taliban, however, is still very much uh, there. Which The Taliban, of course, ruled Afghanistan from 1996 uh, to 2001 until it was um, rooted out by US and foreign troops. Um, do you feel the sense on the part of Afghans that they fear the return of the Taliban once foreign troops have left Afghanistan? Yes, they absolutely do. But just on the Al-Qaeda part, I would like to mention that I really don't think that this problem can be solved uh, either by becoming a network or in military ways because how we, as we see how they went to the, how they were even able to get to the north of Pakistan is because of course people are not educated, the media are either non-existent in some areas or only show one view, so there are illegal channels and there is, there is a lot of misdirected information. So I think in this situation uh, we have to go to the root of the problem and not uh, just try to fight and uh, walk behind Al-Qaeda from country, one country to the next. Uh, we have to work on the roots. We have to work on education. We have to uh, work on uh, having diverse media everywhere in the world. I mean, of course, now I'm saying that because it's my job <laughs> also, but I think really it, it would be a solution to the problem. Um, about your question on the Taliban, people are very much afraid, especially those people who were um, in the country during that time, even those who, uh, who went um, to other countries and, and came back later, because of what they've seen, I mean, especially in, in smaller places uh, where there were um, really horrible things the Taliban have done, or also about, especially women, I know some working women in, in Kabul who have pra practically hidden during that whole time and not gone out, and I mean, I see what kind of personalities they have and how hard it must have been for them to go through it, especially not knowing if it will ever end. <laughs> Um, so, of course, they are very, very worried to lose their position, to lose their ab ability to work, to be in society. And not only about women, uh, also about men, about everyone who likes to speak their mind, who likes to work, uh, to live a free life. Uh, it is a, a, a horrible thought, but they are not uh, convinced that they will come back. Uh, I think there is a big sense that uh, that, that can be avoided somehow um, through um, well, not only through the, the um, Afghan army, but also through uh, smaller uh, militias um, that will probably uh, come up. So I think people are, are not, not necessarily convinced that they will come back, especially not to power and especially not uh, to Kabul. Well, I doubt there is a sentiment that the return of the Taliban is inevitable, though, once foreign troops leave. What's your take on that? I don't know where that sense is, to be honest. Uh, that's the problem. Um, well, if you look at the Taliban as an... As an well, the Taliban itself has numerous times uh, announced and proclaimed that they are going to to, to uh, make an attempt to, to come back and, and take over control of the country, hasn't they? Yeah, but they've also engaged in the political process. And they've also pronounced uh, publicly that we cannot uh, assume that we'll be back in power as forcefully as in the past. We cannot assume that we'll have uh, the uh, authority we had and the threat of the state that they created. And they've also publicly been, there, there have been cracks within the Taliban movement, you know, as, as an organization now, there are people who are saying, it cannot continue the way we have done it. We have to basically come around 
with other groups in the country uh, and become part of the polity. You know, they, they've, they've said that and they're on record. So I don't see them as uh, returning as, as a force and basically sweeping across the country and then creating their own emirate. That's not going to happen. They will have to talk to the Afghan government. And the Afghan state is in a much better position than it was previously. The democratic space that has been created as the freedom of speech, the media is booming, you know. So there is a very close scrutiny of what is going on. And it's, uh, the other thing that maybe goes, uh, it slips under the door, and there are so many things that happen. The, the leadership in the country now, the political leadership, the elite, it's, it's a different situation for them. And they don't want to lose the prestige that they've had for the past 12 years. So they will fight on. So what and are you saying? There's a new Taliban now, Taliban 2.0, if you will, a, m a more softer, more lenient Taliban? No, no there are uh, different groups within Taliban. There are field commanders who are very radical, who are saying they're going to continue to fight. Uh, but there are also Taliban who, who are political savvy, uh, politically savvy, and they know that it's not going to last long. The point is, is Pakistan going to be cooperating? Because Pakistan is the key to the Afghan issue. Because Taliban, to be honest, I mean, I would claim this with some, uh, with some uh, emphasis that pa Taliban would collapse within three months if, once Pakistan st stopped supporting it. And the Pakistanis are not going to do that. Uh, because we know that the Taliban have, and Al-Qaeda itself, it, it has basically uh, captured the Pakistani state, you know. Uh, the Pakistani state is hostage to them. There's a Pakistani journalist, uh, Ahmad Shahzad, who was killed by ISI in 2008, I guess. He did a brilliant report on this, how the Al-Qaeda uh, members were arrested from within the Pakistani army, and how Al-Qaeda knew their every location they were moved to. And finally, uh, basically, they attacked one of the biggest bases in, in Pakistan, Mehran base, and they knew how to get in, how to get out. So it's the whole machinery of Pakistan that is behind Taliban. Would you agree, Robert Reed, the uh, solution to uh, the Taliban phenomenon and problem lies not in Afghanistan itself, but in Pakistan? Basically, yes. I mean, I think, you know, I was thinking when I was listening to um, my colleagues discuss this, there, there are a couple of things that are different the last time, you know, than, than were the last time the Taliban, you know, came into power. One, um, a lot of people in the urban areas welcomed the Taliban before because they were so fed up with the civil war, the, you know, the constant threats to life and limb, um, being robbed at checkpoints, uh, you know, everything that went on with life in a country that had descended into chaos and civil war. The Taliban was seen as, you know, as people who, you know, would restore some semblance of order and deal with people on a decent level. That illusion will be you know, not be around this time. The other thing is Pakistan, and it'll be interesting to see how the Pakistanis play this, um, because one thing that's different uh, for Pakistan before is Pakistan now threat faces a jihadi threat that they did not face in the past, you know. Ever since the, uh, you know, the attack on the, you know, in the Red Mosque in Islamabad in, what, 2007, um, there is an element you know, in the jihadi movement in Pakistan that has declared war in the Pakistani state. Um, there may be people in Pakistan who may have second thoughts about just opening up the treasury and the political largesse to the Taliban as they, you know, had done before. So I don't have an answer for that, but I think that definitely will influence the way Pakistan responds. And Karin Shedla, the United States more or less has, seems to have acknowledged that the Taliban is here and here to stay by engaging in political dialogue with them in uh, Doha, Qatar. Now, the talks have not been uh, completed also due to uh, President Karzai's uh, protests, if you will. But um, do you think that was a right move on the part of the U.S. to, to engage uh, with the Taliban instead of ignoring them? You know, it is uh, very ironic for me uh, how the discussion in Pakistan is going and how the discussion about Afghanistan is going, because in Pakistan there is really a big uproar when people talk about uh, talking to the Taliban, really thinking that we have some common ground with them or could uh, get some achievement by, 
by talking to them. I mean, the only thing I, I can, I, based, I personally think the only thing you can do is to split some territory, uh, to give them some space and uh, have some space by, uh, on your own, but um, to politically find some common ground with them where you could agree on some common uh, rules or common understanding, I think that, in my personal opinion, it is an illusion. But on the other hand, I see, of course, how some political leaders think that we have to include them because they are a big force. And until they are in the system, um, yeah, there has to be some exchange of information, of course. But to really include them, uh, I think, is frightening people as much as, well, not maybe as much, but also very much than as coming them to power, I think. Uh, because, of course, women, for example, they fear, um, OK, if there is some negotiation with the Taliban, what will they be compromising about? Uh, is it us? <laughs> is it our rights? <laughs> and um, so I think it's a very dangerous process. And one person who very much felt excluded from the talks with the Taliban is President Karzai, uh, Malai's doubts. Uh, very enigmatic figure, isn't he? A lot of people even see him uh, not as the solution, but the problem um, that plagues Afghanistan today. Um, as an Afghan, would you agree that President Karzai is... is no, not really. Problem? I mean, I, I've had my own criticism of our president, but if you look at our history in our recent past, the kind of heads of states that we've had, he's head and shoulders above anything that we've had in the past. I mean, uh, this is a guy who sometimes says things uh, but don't, doesn't really mean them. For example, when it comes to media and freedom of media, he's agreed with the Ulama Shura several times. You know, we'll do this, this and that. But then, practically, he never basically puts uh, strong checks on our media. Uh, when it comes to this particular case, uh, he was dead right about it, you know, because it was a Pakistani plot, the way it played out in Doha and Taliban basically declaring their, their own state there, uh, it was totally wrong. The Americans got it uh, very wrong and uh, they uh, accepted it and President Karzai uh, had the backing of the population saying, then who are we if that's the state? So he was dead right about it. And to be honest, he's done so much work now when it comes to uh, political settlement and reconciliation that he knows all the, 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 the issues uh, in and out. Um, uh, the other point is that uh, Taliban, um, you said that uh, uh, people are afraid that they are going to have uh, split the country, they have their own small fiefdom. That's not going to happen. They're, uh, ta Taliban leaders are basically saying we are going to become part of the system. Like, uh, girls' education is something that every Taliban member says, yeah, that's something we have to agree to. Uh, we cannot continue like that. And there's so many former Taliban members, their ex-foreign minister, their ambassador in Pakistan, they now sit in Kabul and Kandahar, you know, they are part of the political process, they, they run for parliament. So uh, if you look at the Taliban, you know, they're, as I said, they're pragmatic politicians. And as soon as they uh, see a shot, they can have a shot at power, they'll just go for it. And it's not just the Taliban that is perceived as pragmatic, but also President Karzai, who, whether or not you believe he was a problem or a solution, will end this term by next year because the elections are coming up in Afghanistan in April. And let's have a quick look at the challengers who stand for election. Dozens of candidates took part in the last presidential election. The number in next year's vote is expected to be less. Former Afghan Foreign Minister Abdullah Abdullah has put himself forward. He ran in the 2009 election and lost to President Karzai. The present Foreign Minister Salmai Razul is also considered a next possible president. Razul is not openly committed to any of the major political coalitions in Afghanistan. Observers say Abdul Razul Sayyaf also has good chances of becoming president. He fought the Russians in the 1980s and has close links to Islamist groups. The last presidential elections were marred by allegations of fraud. The question now is whether they'll be more transparent and fair this time. Well, Malai Daoud, you just saw who's uh, running for election to succeed President Karzai. Anyone you like? Uh, it's not about my liking, I guess. Well, you're an <laughs> Afghan, so at the end of the day, it is uh, a matter of whether you like one of them or not. Do you I'm, think one of them can lead Afghanistan into a more hopeful future? Well, uh, it's hopeful because there are so many checks and balances in place now. So they cannot have just a free ride, basically. That's the good point about it. Um, uh, of course, uh, I'm happy there's a coalition between the 
very forces that fought in our urban centers in 19, uh, early 1990s. Uh, Abdullah Abdullah's running mate is from Hizb Islami, and the second one is from the Wahdat Islami. It's basically, these are the parties fighting each other. Now they're running on the same ticket. So that's a very positive move. Uh, I don't have a particular distaste for any of them, and it's not about particular liking. But I guess the continuity will be there. They have all been saying the same thing. We'd like the, the continuity to be there, but we would reform slowly. So that's important. Uh, Robert Reed, does it even matter who's going to become president of Afghanistan? Because as you've pointed out, the complexities of the country with warlords, perhaps we yielding more influence than any president uh, could ever do, any tribal leader yielding more influence than any president could, could possibly ever do. Yeah, but I don't think that means the position is irrelevant. Um, you know, for one thing, um, someone who has the ability or the wherewithal to negotiate these various modus vivendi, you know, with regional leaders. And also, I think, you know, what they may need in the short term anyway is basically a president who can talk to the foreign community. They're really going to need that, you know. I mean, as I've said before, um, you know, what caused the collapse of Najibullah's government uh, after the Soviets withdrew as much as anything was the collapse of the Soviet Union and the support that they provided. Um, you know, nationalist feelings aside, Afghanistan really needs the West in the, in the coming years, and they need a president who can talk to Westerners. Karzai's problem, Karzai can, can talk at one level to Westerners, but um, as my colleague said, he's got a tendency to flare off at the mouth. You know, if you know him, if you know anything about him, you know that this is just talk. I'm going to join the Taliban if the Americans do this or that. No one takes that seriously, but it makes a big impact outside the country. People don't get the joke outside the country. And, you know, they need a president who, you know, can sell himself to the major donor countries while at the same time, you know, maintaining enough of a sense of authority in Afghanistan that he just doesn't look like a foreign puppet. Karin Shedla, uh, barring unforeseen events, the election is supposed to take place next April. Is this something that uh, the people on the streets are talking about? Is this something that is already riling up the interest of the average Afghan on the street? Well, in my observation, not so much, but of course, with the people I'm talking to, uh, mostly journalists and uh, intellectuals, they are talking about it already a lot. Um, and I think that the sense that the next president should be someone who is staying calm in critical situations is the most basic one, because I, uh, well, you mentioned something, and also I think with as fragile as the whole region is, and there are some... Uh, also little fights with Pakistan about little areas. So I think it is very important that especially when one country comes on with a strong rhetoric that you don't uh, shoot back uh, with, with harsh words immediately. And I think that is most important also for people, someone they can, um, yeah, they can have some, um, they, can, they think that will stay calm in critical situations. I think that is, that is most uh, basic. Um, yeah, and I think, uh, of course, they, they need someone who is a diplomat as well. As you mentioned, with all the um, provinces, with powerful people in there, um, powerful political leaders who also um, are demanding their... Well, they are part of the, <laughs> of the cake. Um, I think uh, you really have to be able to balance that power somehow. And the Taliban, Malai's doubt, have already said they will not participate in this election uh, in, in April. What do you make of this? Does it matter? Do you think that the democratic process is weakened uh, as a result? It doesn't matter when it comes to the process and the long-term achievement the country is going to have. Of course, it does matter when they uh, bar people from uh, going to polls. You know, the security may not be as good as uh, if Taliban have, had cooperated. But there's a lot of irony also in this country. Like the Taliban members uh, actively collect registration cards for different candidates right now. In, in exchange for money sometimes, in exchange for loyalty and stuff like that. So it's not that black and white. There's a lot of gray area there. And uh, I'm sure some of the former Taliban members are going to run for the, because we also have the uh, elections for um, uh, our provincial councils. So they're going to run for those. Uh, they would also back a particular um, uh, candidates for the presidency because they also have a lot of tribal 
affiliations with some of the people because it's not only a war of uh, two ideologies, the Islamists against the basically democratic forces. It's also a war of different tribes with each other who are jockeying for power. And uh, that will all be played out in this election. Robert Reed, all of you today on today's show have more or less uh, evaluated the ISAF mission and the, the foreign troops present in Afghanistan as a positive thing, looking back. If, you, if we evaluate the 12 years, all of you more or less have said it, it was, with all the shortcomings involved, a good thing. But if you had to really boil it down to the more concrete facts, what has this mission accomplished 12 years after? Well, I think it has given... <clears throat> It has given Afghanistan a structure. It has had limited security success in different parts of the country to allow um, the development of, of institutions. It has provided a degree of hope to particularly the urban populations, to women, to other groups that felt disenfranchised under the Taliban. And, you know, it, it gave a chance. I think, you know, again, it's no secret, it's no great insight. It was an under-resourced mission. The Americans, there was division within the United States government about whether even to have a mission in Afghanistan, you know, just in the, you know, the, the thing and leave. Um, there was drama about whether ISAF would only be limited to Kabul, if you remember, or, you know, expanded out of, outside the country. It, you know, it was the stepchild of the Bush administration. And it never really, by the time attention and focus and resources were made available, the political sport was gone. And Karin Chiedla, uh, then on the opposite side, what do people in Afghanistan criticize about the mission when you talk about them? Well, what is it that they say, no, at the end of the day, after 12 years, we're not satisfied because... Well, you know, honestly, before I came to Afghanistan for the first time, I would have thought that they were much more critical of war crimes and things like that. And of course, there are people who speak out about that uh, very intensely. But uh, in general, uh, overall, the whole conversations you have, it's not that much of an issue. And I think that is probably also our view that um, here uh, we see it as a really uh, big problem when some soldiers die, but there they are kind of used to conflict for a long time. So it is not uh, something very abnormal uh, happening. Um, but I think that we also, what we don't see here is that it is more complex than just Taliban against the military now, but that there are other groups, rivalries, uh, rivalries in uh, the provinces that are very um, important and that might also break out again if the foreign troops are uh, not anymore at one place or the other. I mean, at some places it is not that relevant, but at others it might make a difference. And um, so we might have a difficult situation. But on the other hand, I think people are yeah, prepared we, for that. We forget. When talking about the insurgency, it's it's not just the Taliban. People in the West tend to give Taliban use the term Taliban as a broad brush for everybody who's got a beef against the government. You know, there's the Islam Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, there are factions of Hizb Islami, there's the Haqqani group whose relations to the Taliban are somewhat questionable. And you know, any kind of settlement like this, you've got to bring everybody on board or you've still got a serious and also you have criminal groups that criminal are groups. also acting. Yeah. And bring back some board. Well, I doubt. Robert Reed has listed a number of accomplishments on the part of the mission, and Karin Chela more or less confirmed that, uh, yes, the mission is more, uh, widely uh, perceived in a positive uh, light in Afghanistan. But if you do polls, ironically speaking, if you do polls in countries like the U.S. or in Germany on the mission in Afghanistan, many people are very critical. They're saying, get our troops out. 3,000 foreign troops have already been killed throughout this mission. Do you think... Um, the leaders, the Western leaders, have not been sufficiently able to explain the mission to their own people and perhaps even the success that came with it. Well, I guess it was also the kind of expectation that was raised to a certain level. And the goalposts will change all the time. You know, we are doing, we are going to defeat Al-Qaeda. Oh, and we are going to do state building. All the women in 10 years' time are going to be going to schools, work, and they will not be wearing burqas and so on so forth. And that's, I guess, the problem. And the people here, they're, they're extremely confused. But if you look at the polls in Afghanistan, the support for the mission, the support for our state, is still above 70, 80 percent, you know. Support for Taliban, for example, is 6 percent, you know, at best. So uh, it is basically looking from two different, very different perspectives. In the West, 
uh, you have different expectations because uh, killing of 3,000 people is uh, too much for you. But in our country, as you said, I mean, we've been, we've, we are used to it. In the past, we have, we have had even more casualties. Um, so basically, this is, uh, a, for us, a good mission, maybe outside the big wigs, especially they, they are now at pains to explain to people it's a good one, but they don't get it. Um, on the question of uh, different groups of insurgency, Pakistan is the key. Pakistan is the problem. But the problem in Pakistan is that its army, though the leadership, the kind of British trained leadership, is claiming that they are uh, in control, but they are not. The army itself has been hijacked by Al Qaeda, and there are forces in Pakistan that the eventual collapse of the Pakistani state within some years is imminent to me, at least observing Pakistan. Their uh, nuclear arsenal is going to be a huge problem for, for everyone, especially neighboring countries, because if they go astray, then you don't know what's going to happen. So uh, I guess the focus should be to basically put Pakistan in the limelight and force them, uh, not force them, but at least pressure them into cracking down on those forces in the country. Robert Reid, are you positive about the future of Afghanistan post-2014? You know, yes, shortly. And, yes and no, shortly. Um, I wouldn't invest any money there. I wouldn't uh, you know, recommend that anyone pull up stakes and live there. I don't think collapse is inevitable, though. Karin Chedla. I would invest money there, I would live there, <laughs> and I have great faith in the people of Afghanistan to make the best of the situation, and I think they are much stronger and much uh, better than we think they are here, so I have hope. <laughs> Malaj Daud, both uh, Robert Reed and Khalil Sheila have hope. Do you have hope for the future of your country? Look, What's your take? We've been a rentier state since 1809, so we are going to need the money in order to sustain our state basically. If the money is there, then I'm very positive that this country is going to make the strides like in cricket and football. <laughs> very good. Well, on that positive note, uh, this country of Afghanistan certainly has gone through some hardship, not only through the past 12 years, but through some 300 years. Uh, and we will, of course, continue to monitor the situation there and follow the events there very closely. For now, I want to thank my guests for their incredible insight into this very complex country. I want to thank you out there for tuning in and looking forward to seeing you again next week for a new edition of Quadriga.